nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Uh, my name is uh, Wes Sanders. I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, I've been teaching at Salt Lake Community College about 10 years. And so I, um, I teach courses in microscopy, nanotechnology, chemistry, and material science. So uh, working with me today also is uh, Glenn Johnson. Uh, he's our microscopy lab coordinator. He will be conducting the remote access portion of um, the AFM component of this um, session. So Glenn, did you want to uh, say a couple things uh, real quick? Uh, sure, yeah. Like you said, my name is Glenn Johnson. I've been working in the microscopy lab for a few years now with atomic force, scanning electron and transmission electron microscopes. And uh, today I'll be doing a demonstration with AFM from my basement. So hopefully that'll be enjoyable. <laughs> All right, excellent, excellent. So what I wanna do is take about 25-ish minutes and give you a general overview of the atomic force microscope. And what the atomic force microscope primarily does is it records the surface uh, topography of samples of interest. So we're interested in recording the shape are the uh, contour of surfaces with nanoscale and microscale structures. So the AFM unit that Glenn will be using today, like I said, from his basement, is our portable AFM system uh, manufactured by um, NanoSurf, and they, uh, they manufacture some really good AFM instrumentation for very reasonable costs. So if you're looking to acquire AFM instrumentation for your uh, for your departments, I highly recommend NanoSurf AFMs. They, uh, they are really uh, robust and they're very um, intuitive and students uh, learn the basics associated with AFM fairly quickly. But in any event, I have two images of, um, uh, AF of uh, samples that were collected using our AFM instrumentation. So we have hair um, in the uh, AFM image to the, uh, to the left, and then we have some bacterial cells in the AFM image to the right. Now, I want to point out that when you record the surface contour of microscale and nanoscale structures, what you're looking at is an electronic representation of the surface contour. So the reason I'm telling you that is because the um, colors that you see in the resulting AFM images, they really don't matter all that much. You may have AFM images that have shades of green, shades of red, shades of gold, okay? What matters in an AFM image is light versus dark because that's how AFM software, um, that's the method that AFM software uses to, um, to express changes in the um, heights along the sample surface. Taller features are shown with brighter shades and shallower or smaller features are represented using darker shades. Now, I believe uh, Glenn may show you um, during the remote, remote access portion of today's AFM demonstration, he may show you how post-processing software can be used in conjunction with AFM images in order to obtain lateral and vertical dimensional information regarding a specimen. So the nice thing about AFM uh, equipment, you can characterize both conductive and non-conductive specimens. So just a, a quick history regarding scanning probe microscopes in general. The first scanning probe microscope was invented in the uh, 1981 by uh, IBM scientists. So the scanning tunneling microscope is a scanning probe microscope that relies on changes in tunneling current in order in order to characterize really small uh, surface features. Now, the STM was revolutionary because it allowed scientists for the first time to see or visualize atoms. And I believe Glenn has an uh, image in his background of, um, uh, I think it's a um, graphite that uh, he recorded with our desktop STM. So again, the nice thing about STM is that we can achieve atomic scale resolution. But there is one setback associated with the STM, and that's that it only can uh, image conductive samples because you're relying on a tunneling current in order to characterize your nanoscale features on your sample of interest. So in 1986, the AFM was invented in order to allow scientists to record surface topography of conductive and non-conductive specimens. So I have some examples of um, AFM images that were collected on our campus of conductive specimens and non-conductive specimens. 
So we have a, uh, an AFM image of a silver grid, and we actually have a lab exercise in our AFM course that allows students to make silver grids, and we characterize the grids using various modes of AFM. And so then we have a, a polycarbonate CD uh, that we can easily image with our AFM systems also. So AFM was revolutionary because it allowed scientists to characterize nanoscale features of both non-conductive and conductive specimens. And one other thing before moving forward, I threw out the term scanning probe microscope. A scanning probe microscope is a characterization tool that uses a special tip or probe in order to scan your sample surface. Now, there's a variety of different probes available for surface characterization, and I'll talk a little bit about the probes uh, here shortly. So there's a lot of information that I'm going to deliberately leave out uh, for, the, uh, for the sake of time, but uh, feel free to contact me or attend my office hour um, if you want to learn more information about the uh, nuances related to uh, AFM operation. So the main AFM components that I'm going to briefly discuss with you today involve the probe, which is an inclusive term of the a involving the AFM tip and the cantilever. Uh, we're going to talk about the photodiode and the AFM scanner. Now, before moving forward and giving you specifics regarding each component, I want to show a brief animation, uh, a brief animation that gives you a general overview of how all these components work in concert in order to uh, image samples. This animation shows the basic principle of the atomic force microscopy technique when it is achieved in contact mode. In essence, the technique relies on feeling the surface of an object with an extremely sharp tip. The radius of such tips can be below 10 nanometers, which allows surface features to be revealed at the nanoscale. An AFM tip is attached to a cantilever whose deflection in general is monitored by the change in reflection of a laser beam from the cantilever onto a photodiode. When AFM scanning is conducted in contact mode, first, the laser, cantilever, and photodiode are lowered together towards the surface of a sample. The cantilever then moves over the surface following a line-by-line -line strategy. As the animation illustrates, when the tip of the cantilever goes down into one of the features on the surface, the angle of the laser beam's reflection changes. This is detected by the photodiode, which gives readings for the scanning of a surface topography. So as you saw in the animation, there is a nanoscale tip that's actually scanned across the sample surface. Now, the nanoscale tip is attached to the end of a flexible diving board referred to as the, uh, as the cantilever. So the tip actually traces over the surface contour. Now, the tip has nanoscale dimensions. So how do we, how do we monitor something that, um, how do we monitor the movement of a, um, of a pyramid-shaped tip with nanoscale dimensions? Well, that's where the laser and the photodiode come into the picture. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the tip is connected to the end of a flexible cantilever. And as the tip traces over the surface contour, the cantilever bends in response. So the tip has micro nanoscale dimensions and the cantilever has micro scale dimensions. I believe most cantilevers are about 200, 300 microns in length. So in any event, the cantilever is large enough for the laser and the photodiode to detect the cantilever's movement. So the cantilever moves in response to the tip tracing the sample topography of our, um, of our specimen of interest. So there are a couple more specifics I'm gonna give you um, regarding the probe because they're very important. Uh, very, it's very important to understand these specifics in order to appreciate and understand the basic operation of an AFM system. So the collective term that's used to describe all three of these components is the probe. Okay, So the substrate is, what, is how we're able to actually mount the probe in the scanner. And as I said before, the cantilever is a flexible diving board that bends in response to the tip moving across the sample surface. I think we lost Glenn. So while we wait on him, I see a couple questions. Um, one is, is breaking the tip a common problem? Um, if you're not careful, it is. And that's one of the things that I'll mention when I'm doing a demonstration. 
Um, the tip actually coming in contact. I'll let Wes discuss that one because there are some uh, forces that are involved with that. So I'll let him take care of that question. I had a question about um, how, can you differentiate between something that's squishy versus something that's hard with a tip when it makes contact? Yes, there are specific modes of AFM that you can do that with. It's called phase. Um, and it's, a, it's an oscillating type of, uh, of tip, so it's going to bounce on it. And basically, um, if you think of it, if, you're, if you push down on your hand and it's a little squishy and then you push down on your desk and a little hard, it can differentiate between the two. But yes, there, there is a mode for that. Um, let's see. Uh, it, the device has a tapping mode and can you explain that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's in his... Um, in his demonstration, but how you have your cantilever uh, and your tip that basically stay in constant contact. You can have it oscillate in air and then uh, it basically taps your sample. And that's for things that are, um, you can break very easily and uh, you, can, um, you, you can set that to how hard you want it to tap your sample. Another question is, is there a non-contact format? Like if yes, you didn't want there to is non-contact. Yeah. And okay. uh, that can be in fluid cells. Um, if you're, you know, if you want to look at bacteria, you don't want to damage the sample. You can do that in a fluid cell where it doesn't actually come in contact with the sample. And that would be like Van der Waal forces between the tip and tip sample interaction forces that uh, it could image from that. So, so yes, the main, we have contact uh, oscillating or tapping, same thing. And then there's also a non-contact. And within each of those, there's subcategories uh, like conductive or phase or lateral force, frictional force. Okay, I'll keep asking a question here. Nope, do, you, do you know uh, the approximate order of magnitude cost of that uh, portable AFM that you showed? That's a good question. Um, we got that before I started in the lab, so I'll let Wes say specifically but i want to say it was around 20 to thirty thousand. but like uh he mentioned it's very robust this is something that we can uh take into schools and demonstrate um or as you're going to see today i can take home and demonstrate from penn state we have one it's a pretty good one from Bruker, and we paid 60 grand for it a good while ago and that seemed to be about the price they stabilized that for a lot of years. I don't know how long ago, because you know the question caught me off guard, but maybe 15 years ago or something, they were like two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Then boom, they went under a hundred. You know, then they stabilized that like a pretty good one, about at sixty, and they stayed there. And they're kind of like cell phones; they're going up in price a little bit, but their performance is better as a return on the money. And the tips we were talking about before, when we try to get decent tips uh, just for the tapping mode, we try to find them for about 50 bucks, but it depends on the vendor. It's like when you go to Amazon and buy the same thing, it could be different prices. So something like that. And they, they break pretty often, especially if you're not you're not familiar with the sample and banging it around and when you mine it and stuff like that. So if you know what you're doing as a user, you won't break it that much. But when you're training students, in some senses, that's what they're there for, to break stuff to learn. So that's just the cost of doing business. Yeah, you know, when, whenever it, I have uh, students yeah. uh, take in and out the probes, I use broken probes. Saves the school yeah, that, a little bit of money. Okay. Yeah, that's about what we do, too. But we just put one in for some polymer that we were unfamiliar with. And uh, we broke a tip right away on that. It was one of our last tips. And how do, you, how do you know when the tip is broken? You can see it. It looks like a, a phonograph tip. Okay. You can yeah, and I'll show you on that. the demonstration that you'll be able to see the cantilever. And basically, when it's broken, it disappears. Yeah. Okay. And how do you prepare the samples? How, where do you get the samples that you test on? Do you do you have other equipment that, uh, and like the silver uh, grid or something like that? Do you, do you need other equipment to prepare the samples themselves, or do you can you buy uh, pieces that you can test on? Yeah, the the silver grid. You, you mean the fabrication of the silver grid? 
Right. So I'm, you know, I want to test uh, students. They want I want to give them a lab that says test this piece and give me a profile of the surface. Where do you get the sample to do that? Typically, we make our own samples in the lab. Um, so that kind of goes along with some micro and nano fabrication. There are some samples that you can order, um, but like that silver grid that you saw, that was something that we uh, made in the lab. We have a research group that have come up with several of these. Um, and it's because it's not like a chemistry lab or physics lab where everything has been set for years. Um, kind of have to do this on the fly. So for us, and, and I don't, I don't want to speak for the, any of the other sites, but we, we typically make our own samples. Yeah, I guess for us, uh, the community college or high school, that might be an issue to get the samples. Um, yeah. Because we don't have the facilities to do that. Yeah, and then uh, I'm sure working with some of the sites, if you know, if you wanted to, you know, we one of the things that we make often are silver nano wires. Um, you know, can we make up a batch and send them to you? I'm sure that some places could help out with that if, if it were an issue. Uh, Glenn, I may yes. show a couple of slides here. Just uh, I just found yeah, some of my slides from AFM. So a couple Thank of you. questions came up. So I'm sure uh, Wes will talk more about it, but. The, Breaking the tip is really like, especially when the sample is kind of like a whiskey sample, it may be half broken too. So as you can see here, so this part might be gone. Doesn't mean that, yeah, most of the time you see that the cantilever is all gone, but um, in some cases we might end up with a dull tip as well. And uh, one other question was, so you will see the, uh, the problem coming about that in your images. So a dull tip will not give you a high resolution. So you need to definitely change to another tip for sure. One other question was about tapping and uh, Glenn showed it with his uh, fingers, uh, good demonstration. So now you're seeing here, this is a, um, um, a modulated tip. That means that it's resonating at some frequency. It's not just hovering on top of the sample while it's still contacting the sample. And there was another question saying, do we actually contact the sample? So it depends really like it becomes a philosophical issue and depends on what you mean by touching in science because uh, there's always going to be like a little bit of a, a gap uh, in some sense because of all these uh, forces in action. But in this case, while we're resonating, as Glenn also uh, explained briefly, so we are like still sending the laser that uh, Wes was talking about, but now the tip is uh, resonating. So we're touching at some point and releasing the tip at another point. And that helps us to collect the information based on this resonance action on this photo detector side. And we can convert that into something meaningful that the computer will process. Another question was about uh, how do we avoid the charging? So actually charging can be helpful for us. For example, we have a mode that's called electrostatic force uh, microscopy, so EFM. And another uh, mode is magnetically understanding the properties of the samples. That's called MFM, so magnetic force microscopy. In those cases, you would like to understand like what kind of a charging we are talking about on the surface, uh, like people image, uh, say, uh, memory chips like the hard drives and etc. on your computers using those kind of modes. But for a typical um, scan, as our guest is asking, you'd like to make sure that you work with, say, mostly non-polar samples. So, of course, the polar samples will create these electrostatic forces, bringing in all those charging problems. But still, uh, your uh, your cantilever beam can counteract that action. It's simply like, uh, as we will talk more about in the advanced uh, uh, upcoming uh, course material, as Bob was explaining, it's really like a spring loaded with a mass kind of thing. So the, the spring kind of tries to compensate for those kind of electrostatic forces. But you're right, all those electrostatic forces might be a serious issue, might be handy too. It depends on what you're trying to image, what you like to understand. All right, y'all, yeah, we're talking about the intermolecular forces um, that are exerted between the uh, AFM tip and the sample specimen of interest. 
So as a matter of fact, that's why the AFM is called the atomic force microscope, because it relies on intermolecular forces in order to characterize nanoscale and microscale features on sample surfaces. So uh, for those of you who teach uh, physical science or chemistry in particular, uh, this would be a um, uh, this would be a good link uh, to your uh, to your classroom because I used to be a high school science teacher many years ago. Um, I'm teaching chemistry at the uh, Salt Lake Community College now, and one of the topics that's covered is intermolecular forces, particularly London dispersion forces, uh, dipole forces, and um, uh, Van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonding, excuse me. So in any event, it's those forces that are acting between the tip and the sample in order to allow the system uh, to characterize the, um, the surface of our specimen of interest. So the nature of the intermolecular force between the tip and the sample depends upon the tip sample distance. So I, I believe I mentioned um, um, at, the, at the start of my presentation that there are many different flavors of um, AFM. And the flavor of AFM that you use depends upon the probe. And the reason why you have a variety of probes available uh, to use in SE, uh, AFM systems, because each probe is specifically machined or tailored to respond to a certain type of intermolecular force. So later in this presentation, we're going to discuss three main modes of AFM operation, contact mode, tapping mode, and non-contact mode. And in each case, they take advantage of a different intermolecular force. And the intermolecular force that's felt between the tip and the sample is dependent upon the tip sample distance. So let's jump back and talk about the cantilever really quickly. As I told you previously, the can cantilever is about 200 to 300 microns in length. And at the end of a cantilever, there is a uh, pyramid-shaped um, tip um, at the end, and the tip traces over the sample surface. Now, the cantilever, the way the cantilever responds to, tips, uh, to the uh, tip motion depends upon the nature of the forces between the tip and the sample. So as you can see in the following images, we can have uh, the cantilever bending downwards, or we can have an upwards bending observed with the cantilever. So the question is, when do we have a downwards cantilever bend? Uh, when do we have a downwards motion? When do we have an upwards motion? So whenever we uh, have attractive forces um, exerted between the AFM tip and the specimen, particularly Van der Waals forces like dipole forces and London dispersion forces, the AFM tip is, is, is drawn closer to the sample surface and it causes the cantilever to bend down, okay? Now, if we have repulsive forces between the tip and the sample, then we see an upward bending of the cantilever. So, I added, um, I made a note here um, to um, let you know that you can also relate this uh, to chemistry and uh, physics principles also, because it's the uh, Pauli exclusion principle that's responsible for uh, the um, uh, repulsive forces that are felt between the tip and the sample surface. And I wanna point out that the repulsive forces are not felt until the tip is basically making contact with the sample surface. So as a matter of fact, we're gonna talk about contact mode AFM imaging here shortly. So keep in the back of your mind that it's repulsive forces that are felt between the tip and the sample during contact mode. So one other thing I wanna mention uh, regarding the cantilever before moving on to the electronic components, uh, the cantilever stiffness is very important in AFM operation. I told you at the beginning of my presentation that generally AFM, uh, AFM probes are made of two different materials, either silicon or silicon nitride. As it turns out, silicon is stiffer than silicon nitride, and we use the spring constant in order to quantify the cantilever stiffness or how easily it can bend. Now, the uh, spring constant is extremely important because it basically controls how the cantilever responds as, it's, uh, as the tip scans across the sample surface. So obviously, stiffer cantilevers aren't going to respond to tip sample forces as easily as a, a flexible cantilever, right? So when we have a flexible or floppy cantilever, a cantilever with a low 
or um, small uh, spring constant, that cantilever is going to bend more uh, towards the sample when attractive forces are between uh, the tip and the sample surface. And that's by design. OK, that's by design. We want the cantilever to respond differently so we can have different operating modes of AFM. In one particular case, we want a stiff cantilever. So we're going to use a cantilever with a large spring constant. And in other operating modes, we want a more floppy or loose cantilever um, because, again, that's going to be the um, optimal cantilever behavior for that particular mode. And again, we'll, 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 we'll go back to uh, cantilever stiffness or spring constant when we um, get to the um, operating modes that we'll talk about here just in just a little bit. But one other thing I want to mention regarding the um, uh, spring constant of cantilevers, it's a um, parameter that's dependent upon the cantilever, uh, cantilever dimensions, particularly cantilever thickness, width, and length, in addition to Young's modulus, which is also a, a physical parameter related to stiffness, but it has to do more so with um, uh, stress and strain measurements. Right. So when you apply stress to a material, um, when you measure the corresponding strain, you take the quotient of the two that gives you your Young's modulus. So you're basically looking at how much the material stretches as you apply force. So all of those uh, all of those uh, parameters are used to determine the overall stiffness of the cantilever. And one other quick thing that I want to um, uh, mention, because it relates to the fabrication techniques that you will learn about in a, uh, upcoming sessions, the probes that are used for AFM imaging, they are machined using a lot of the techniques that you will learn about in the fabrication uh, portion of the uh, intro to nano workshop, particularly photolithography, wet etch, and dry etch. So the same uh, manufacturing techniques that are used to create the integrated circuits and in consumer electronics, AFM probe manufacturers use those same techniques in order to pattern or machine uh, AFM probes. So the next main component of the AFM system I want to mention is the photo detector, because let's take a couple steps back and look at how we're actually tracing the sample surface. We have a nanoscale pro, a nanoscale, a nanoscale pyramid shaped tip attached to the end of a cantilever with a micro scale dimensions. Okay, it will be very impractical to use an optical microscope to kind of monitor the motion of that um, motion of that uh, of that system, because obviously you can't see the nanoscale tip with an optical uh, microscope, and the cantilever will be uh, too small to measure any. Uh, the, the, the optical microscope doesn't have the magnification to observe appreciable cantilever motion. So how do you do it? How do you monitor pro motion in order to record the surface topography? Well, what we do is we have a case where the cantilevers are coated with a reflective material. So the back of the cantilever is coated with the reflective material, which allows a laser beam to be bounced off the back of the cantilever like you saw in the animation that I showed you at the beginning of our presentation. So the silicon or silicon nitride cantilevers are coated with a reflective coating that allows a laser beam to bounce off the back of the cantilever to strike the four quadrant photo detector or photodiode. Now there's a reason why the photo detector or the photodiode is divided up into four quadrants. Because what the AFM system manages to do is is use the four quadrants to track tip motion. Okay, so if the tip is tracing over a, a raised feature on your sample surface, obviously the cantilever is going to raise in response to the tip motion over the over the hill, and as a result, the resulting laser beam is going to move in the upward part of the photo detector. And if the tip traces over a valley of our sample of interest, then the cantilever is going to bend downwards in response. And as a result, the reflected laser beam is going to move down the bottom half of the photo detector. So the relative uh, vertical position of the reflected laser beam on the photo detector surface is how we measure surface topography. Now, as it turns out, there are frictional forces that also influence uh, tip motion. So as you're scanning, uh, as you're dragging an AFM uh, tip across your sample of interest, 
the frictional forces are causing um, torsional or twisting uh, motion of the cantilever. So that means the laser beam, in addition to moving vertically, it's also moving horizontally across the um, photodetector surface. So what that means is this, the AFM system has the capability to not only measure um, surface topography, but you can simultaneously measure frictional forces as well. So as a matter of fact, in one of the labs that we have our students perform in our um, AFM course that we offer at SLCC, we actually have students etch, um, uh, use a nano shaving to etch a uh, geometric pattern in a uh, polymer film, and then they characterize the uh, topography and the frictional forces um, at the same time in one scan. Now, the last electronic component that I wanna discuss uh, before we get into the different operating modes of AFM is the AFM scanner. Now, for those of you who are um, have some background in electronics or may have um, uh, tinkered with electronic um, hobbies such as RC racing and all of that, you may be familiar with electromechanical stepper motors, right? So you can have a um, uh, you can have a circuit or a driver connected to a electromagnetic motor, you can control the revolution rate, um, how frequently the, um, the uh, motor oscillates and all that business. Now, we can't use similar electronics in an AFM system to move our probe, because remember, the point of an AFM system is to record the nanoscale and microscale topographical features on our sample surface. So electromechanical stepper motors have uh, step sizes that are way too large for what we want to see. Okay, so imagine using an AFM system to image a carbon nanotube, single wall carbon nanotube that has diameters between two and three nanometers. So if you have an electromechanical stepper motor with a step size that's about one micron or one micrometer, you want to completely miss the, um, the um, carbon nanotube. So what engineers have figured out, you know, those who um, manufacture AFM systems, they figured out, okay, we need a way to move the probe with smaller step sizes. Okay, we need to figure out how, the, uh, how to move the probe ideally in angstrom increments. So what AFM scanners contain are piezoelectric crystals or piezoelectric materials. And piezoelectric materials are materials whose... Um, whose um, uh, size basically changes with the application of electric current. Okay, if you apply current one way, you have compression of the um, piezoelectric device, do it the other way, reverse the polarity, the crystal extends in the opposite direction. The reason why that happens is uh, the piezoelectric material consists of, ionically, uh, of ionic compounds. And again, for those of you who teach chemistry, you know an ionic compound, uh, contains a crystal lattice structure, a repeating arrangement of cations and anions. So the ionic bonds in the ionic material and the ionic compound are very strong. So the ions are resilient to any type of um, influence. They really don't want to move. So by applying the um, necessary high voltage to the scanner, you can disturb the positions of, those, um, of the ions in the crystal lattice structure. Right, so if you um, if you apply again, if you apply the appropriate high voltage um, and the appropriate polarity, the cations and anions will be repelled in the crystal lattice structure of the piezoelectric material, and the scanner will compress. So if you reverse the polarity, you will allow the cations and anions to be attracted to the electrodes, so the piezo material will expand. So the nice thing about using piezoelectric materials and AFM scanners is that you, the nice thing about it is you can achieve angstrom level step sizes. Okay, so you can have uh, the nano, you can have the AFM probe move in increments that are about a tenth of a nanometer in size. So with a um, closed loop AFM scanner, and again, I don't have time to get into closed loop systems. That's a, that's something we can discuss. Uh, during office hour, if you like, 
but with a closed loop um, uh, scanner and a very, very sharp tip, you're able to achieve atomic scale resolution with the, uh, with the AFM due to the small increments in which the piezoelectric materials move the, um, move the tip. So now in the uh, remaining uh, portion of this presentation, I would like to talk to you about the three basic operating modes of, um, of AFM. So again, there are other flavors of AFM available, and we'll get into some of those, uh, some of those uh, flavors in, uh, of uh, additional flavors of AFM in our, um, in our AFM session scheduled, scheduled for April. But in any event, the three operating modes we're going to talk about are very quickly are contact mode, non-contact mode, and tapping mode. So an AFM manufacturer by the name of Park Systems and put together some really nice animations uh, in order to um, allow people to visualize how the, um, these modes actually work. So these are very short animations. They're, they're like less than a minute in length. So um, I'll play the animation for you and then we'll discuss um, uh, the key points that, uh, that were uh, shown in the, uh, in the clip. Contact mode. In this method, the cantilever scans across the sample surface. Because the cantilever is in contact with the surface, Strong repulsive force causes the cantilever to deflect as it passes over topographical features. Okay, so with contact mode, we have the AFM tip making direct contact with the sample surface. There's basically no tip sample interaction. And if you remember from our discussion regarding intermolecular forces, we have repulsive forces that are exerted between the tip and the sample during contact mode. And again, the repulsive forces that are felt between the tip and the sample arise from concepts associated with the Pauli exclusion principle. Tip atoms and sample atoms don't want to occupy the same space, right? So as a result, we're going to observe cantilever deflection. And in order to, in order to monitor the cantilever deflection during contact mode, Again, we rely on the reflection of a laser beam um, and the reflected beam hits our photodetector. And as the cantilever bends, um, based on the um, extent of tip sample interaction, the position of the reflected laser beam is going to change as a result. So contact mode operation is governed by, the, obviously, the topography of the sample, how flexible the cantilever is, how quickly the cantilever is scanning across the sample surface and how well the feedback loop is optimized. And again, the feedback loop is a pivotal, very important component of the AFM system. And again, I don't have the time to get into specifics associated with the feedback loop. Um, we can discuss that more in the office hour if you like, but I do wanna mention that the feedback loop is how we obtain the um, data that we ultimately use to create the topographical images. Because what the feedback loop does is it monitors it monitors the tip sample forces um, based on the behavior of the cantilever. So an AFM operator enters in a value known as the set point. And the set point is either your amplitude of vibration or your uh, cantilever deflection that you want that you want maintained during imaging. So the AFM system tries to maintain either vibrational amplitude, are the tip sample force that's entered in via the set point by the user. And if the vibrational amplitude or if the um, cantilever deflection changes, then there's a signal sent to the ZPA zone in order to raise or lower the scanner uh, in order to maintain a vibrational amplitude or cantilever deflection that's consistent with the user-defined set point. And as it turns out, the amount that the scanner is raised or lowered is, is, is consistent with the uh, sample heights on our, on our specimen of interest. And again, there's a lot more um, that's involved with the, um, with the feedback loop. And again, if you want to learn more about it, uh, we can discuss it during uh, my office hour. Uh, so what are the advantages of contact mode operation? So basically, you achieve high resolution. Okay, because you're relying on direct cantilever deflection in order to trace your surface topography. And in order for contact mode to work effectively, you have to use a cantilever with a low spring constant. Because you, for every bump in every valley on your sample surface, you want the cantilever to respond 
right? You want the cantilever to respond every time the tip traces over a valley or traces over a bump. So in order to make sure that every surface feature is traced or tracked, then you need to um, use a cantilever with a, um, with a uh, low spring constant. So it'll be very floppy so it can be in response, so it can respond quickly to changes in surface topography. Now, there are some disadvantages associated with contact mode. It's not ideal to use contact mode with um, very soft samples like biological materials or polymers. Because again, silicon nitride is a, a fairly fairly uh, uh, stiff material. And again, you're, uh, you're tracing a pyramid-shaped tip across your sample surface. So contact mode, uh, using contact mode to image polymers or biological materials can lead to some uh, sample damage, again, due to the um, resiliency of the tip and due to the very strong forces between the tip and the sample. So if you want to image a polymer or a, or a biological material, what do you use? You use tapping mode. So I have a short video to um, uh, that describes some of the um, uh, basic principles associated with uh, tapping mode. And then after the video plays, I'll give you some additional specifics. Tapping mode. In this alternative technique to non-contact mode, the cantilever again oscillates just above the surface but at a much higher amplitude of oscillation. The bigger oscillation makes the deflection signal large enough for the control circuit, and hence an easier control for topography feedback. It produces most AFM results, but blunts the tip's sharpness at a higher rate, ultimately speeding up the loss of its imaging resolution. Okay, so before I give you some specifics regarding tapping mode, there's a couple questions in the chat. Uh, question one, are these machines sensitive to thermal change? Uh, no, these, these, machines are, uh, these machines are designed to operate under ambient conditions. Um, now you can, uh, you can um, modify the environment of the, um, uh, the imaging environment by using a fluid cell or by using a, a glove box uh, purged with nitrogen gas. So if you're imaging a um, if you're imaging a temperature or humidity, excuse me, a humidity sense uh, a sample sensitive to humidity, again you can use a glove box purged with nitrogen in order to um, uh, image that um, sample that's uh, sensitive to humidity and moisture. And then number two, can resolution be adjusted by using sort of pulse width modulation like in Cephas? Short answer: Yes. But that the um, adjustment is a um, is a um, inherent component of the uh, uh, software that's used to control the um, the AFM system. Now, when Glenn uh, when Glenn uh, conducts the remote access demo, he'll point out a couple of the uh, parameters that you have to adjust in order to obtain a high resolution image. And some of those uh, parameters, just to name two of them, because uh, they're directly related to question number two, are pixel resolution and your um, scan speed. So pixel resolution are, are, are lines per lines per scan or dots per scan, and your scan speed that has a direct impact on your on your resolution. So rather than using a, a pulse width modulation uh, circuit uh, to uh, control the um, the number of dots per line that you acquire in each line scan, you punch that value in your, um, punch the value in the AFM software. So generally you wanna use 256 to 512 um, dots per line for your initial scan. Because as you increase your, as you increase your dots per line or pixel resolution, you acquire a higher resolution image because you're acquiring, you're acquiring more dots per line. So your picture will look prettier, but it'll take a really long time to collect your image. And the same thing with your scan speed. Generally, uh, when you use an AFM system, you wanna conduct a quick and dirty scan. So you use a low pixel resolution and a fast scan speed just to scan the general area. And then afterwards, uh, once you find an area of interest, you increase pixel resolution to uh, collect more data points per line in order to um, you know, make your picture prettier and you slow down, uh, slow down the scan speed so in order to ensure that the tip is accurately tracing your, uh, your specimen of interest. So 
in the animation that you all just um, that you all just watched, you should have noticed a key uh, a key difference in this case. Now with with contact mode, the tip is was was making direct contact with the sample surface, and as the tip traced over features of interest, the cantilever bent in response. Now in the case of tapping mode, what you're doing is you're deliberately oscillating the AFM cantilever at its resonant frequency. And its resonant frequency is the frequency at which the vibrational amplitude is at its max, okay? So when you image in tapping mode, what you're doing is you're relying on a dampening of that vibrational amplitude, okay? So the, the, the resonant frequency is fixed. The resonant frequency is fixed. It's dependent upon physical parameters associated with the probe, such as probe mass and the spring constant like we discussed previously. And remember, spring constant is based on the Young's modulus of the material, the length of the cantilever, the thickness, and the width, okay? So the resonant frequency is based on the dimensions of the cantilever. But it's the, it's the vibrational amplitude that's ch that changes. And that's the, the vibrational amplitude is what's monitored uh, throughout the course of tapping mode imaging. So when the oscillating tip, when the oscillating tip traces over a raised feature of your specimen of interest, then the oscillating tip has less room to move. Okay, so the vibrational amplitude has decreased. So how do we measure vibrational amplitude in tapping mode? We just look at the oscillation of the laser beam on the photo detector, right? As you can see in this cartoon, in this cartoon image, as the tip is a vibrating tip is over a raised feature, the laser beam is oscillating over a smaller region of the photo detector. Okay, and as the tip tr uh, oscillating tip traces over a depression, then we have more room for the um, for the cantilever to oscillate or vibrate. Right, so we know that because the uh, we can detect that because the um, laser beam is now oscillating over a larger region of the photo detector. And one other thing I failed to mention on the previous slide is that the maximum oscillation range for a cantilever in tapping mode is about 100 nanometers. So when do you use tapping mode? Basically, you use tapping mode if you want to minimize your sample damage. So once again, if you're imaging, um, if you're imaging polymers or biological materials, tapping mode is a better imaging mode to use because again, you're making intermittent contact with your specimen. So that means that you minimize, uh, minimize sample damage. And in order to acquire the best resolution in tapping mode, you generally want to slow down, uh, slow down the scan speed because you want the system, you want to give the system enough time to respond to changes in uh, the vibrational amplitude. Now you can get away with fast scan speeds with contact mode because you're simply measuring cantilever deflection. But in the case of um, tapping mode, you, the AFM system is monitoring the vibrational amplitude of the cantilever, right? So you need to make sure you use a slower scan speed in order to uh, get an accurate representation of the surface topography. And um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over the non-contact uh, video uh, but if you're interested in watching the non-contact uh, animation, um, here's the YouTube link at the bottom of the slide, and it's also included in the um, it's also included in the um, resources um, listing that uh, Renee posted uh, posted to Canvas. Now, what a uh, couple quick notes about non-contact mode before moving on to um, uh, two relevant AFM applications is with non-contact mode, we're still using a vibrating tip, okay? The, um, uh, the tip is still oscillating at its resonant frequency. However, the vibrational amplitude is smaller. In the case of tapping mode, the AFM tip um, was oscillating at a range of motion that covered about 100 nanometers. In this case, the oscillating tip in non-contact mode has a smaller range of oscillation, a smaller vibrational amplitude covers about a one nanometer range of motion. Why? Why the difference? With a non-contact mode, you're not making contact with the sample surface. With non-contact mode, you're relying on short range um, intermolecular forces, particularly Van der Waals forces, 
okay, and London dispersion forces and all of that, which for those of you who teach chemistry know that they're very short range forces. So you're relying on short range forces in order to dampen or, or attenuate the vibrational amplitude of the oscillating cantilever, okay? So when do you use non-contact mode? Okay, when would you want to, um, when would you want to um, use an imaging mode where the tip makes no contact at all with the sample surface? So you wanna use non-contact mode when you have extremely, extremely delicate samples like DNA. As a matter of fact, if you dig in some of the scientific literature regarding imaging uh, DNA strands using AFM, it's almost always conducted in non-contact mode and using a fluid cell because this is the um, this is the uh, very very gentle imaging approach. And for those of you with a background in biology that you know um, know how DNA works, it um, there's a specific physiological pH that that, um, that uh, DNA strands prefer. So not only that, DNA strands have these phosphate groups that are negatively charged. And uh, scientists have figured out how to rely on electrostatic attraction between phosphate groups and a cationic surface to stick the DNA in place, okay? Well, the thing is that um, even though it can, um, it can hold the DNA in place, remember, we, we don't wanna use contact mode or capping mode in that case, or else the um, really strong forces between the tip and the sample will simply drag the DNA back and forth across the specimen, okay? So even though electrostatic charges are holding the DNA in place, that electrostatic attraction can be disrupted if we're dragging a tip across the sample surface. So with non-contact mode, that allows us to image the specimen without making contact with the specimen by relying on short range London dispersion forces to dampen the vibrational amplitude. And once again, since you're imaging with a uh, vibrate, uh, oscillating cantilever, you wanna use a slower scan speed. So really quickly, let's talk about two, um, two quick applications that relate to um, what's uh, going on in the, um, in the news regarding uh, coronavirus. So in addition to, in addition to collecting uh, high resolution images with the AFM, believe it or not, we can also conduct nanomechanical measurements with the AFM as well. So in this first video, I'm gonna show you uh, researchers at uh, Harvard University managed to um, determine the um, adhesion, adhesion forces associated with cells uh, stuck, to a, um, uh, stuck to a flat substrate. So there's no audio um, associated with this video, so I'm gonna uh, uh, annotate as it plays. So let me just pause it for a quick second. In all AFM systems, there's an optical microscope system that's positioned above the cantilever. And this allows AFM users to position the cantilever on an area of the sample of interest. Now the tip is facing down, uh, facing towards the sample on the underside of the cantilever. Even if the tip was facing up towards the microscope, we wouldn't be able to see it. Right, because again, the, the tip has nanoscale dimensions and that's well below, well below the visible light uh, range that we can register with our eyes, right? So on, on, um, on average, the apex of the AFM tip is about 10 nanometers or less. And the smallest wavelength our eyes can register is 400 nanometers. So the AFM tip is way too small for us to see with an optical microscope, but we can position the cantilever with an optical microscope because it has uh, micro scale dimensions. But in any event, you'll see in this video that they're gonna use the AFM probe to basically pick up this cell. And you can do that by adjusting the X and Y position in the, um, in the AFM software. So when you localize the tip above the, um, uh, the cell, you apply force by increasing your set point. And then once the, uh, tip, uh, the, the cell is attached, you raise the, um, you raise the scanner in the Z direction. And then an action detaches the cell from the uh, substrate. 
Now, why do you want to do this? So other than the fact that I think it's really, really neat, um, you can obtain some, again, some adhesive information regarding uh, the, um, the cellular membrane around your biological sample of interest. Now, what this is, uh, this data is a, a force curve. So the uh, force curves basically measure tip sample forces um, as a function of tip sample separation. So the blue curve represents our approach. Okay, so as tip sample uh, distance gets smaller, 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 we and then we finally approach the uh, approach the uh, sample surface. The forces increase considerably because now we have repulsive forces between the tip and the sample. In this case, we finally made contact with the um, with the cell. The red curve represents the withdrawal curve. In this particular case, you're retracting the AFM cantilever from the sample surface, okay? So why is this useful? The red curve tells us the adhesive forces between whatever's attached uh, to the tip and the sample surface. As a matter of fact, I've seen similar studies that allow scientists to determine the uh, tensile strength of carbon nanotubes they were, and, and uh, DNA strands. Uh, I've seen some literature where scientists were able to attach those structures to a tip and a substrate, and then they conducted um, the uh, identical uh, for, uh, excuse me, approach and withdrawal um, procedures, and they were able to assess the tensile strength of those uh, materials tethered between the tip and the um, the tip and the uh, sample surface. So there's a paper uh, that was published not too long ago in which scientists were able to not only image coronavirus with, um, with, the, um, with an AFM, but they were also able to measure the strength, right, the stiffness of an individual coronavirus uh, particle. So before we talk about that research, so we're just going to give you a brief summary. I want to play an animation for you that shows how they were able to do that. And then I'll make two quick uh, comments about the uh, published research, and then um, and then that will be um, that will be it, and we'll get to Glenn's AFM remote access demo. The viruses move around in solution, and once they touch the surface, they'll remain attached. As the viruses are too small to observe by light microscopy, we can only observe them by localizing them with a tiny needle, which is part of the atomic force microscope. After localization, we go to the virus center. Zooming out shows us the essential parts of the atomic force microscope. The red arrow shows how we apply a force to the cantilever. This force deforms the virus and bends the cantilever, which can be measured by the quadrant photodiode. The signal of the photodiode can be converted to the applied force and plotted in a graph. If we watch close up, we see how the virus deforms. This deformation is reversible only when we push a little bit. However, if we push really hard, the virus breaks. From the first part of the indentation curve, we can extract the elasticity of the virus. And the top part tells us what force we need to break it. So basically, that was... Um there was a, um, a research that was posted on uh, a medicalnews.net uh, website where scientists conducted the same type of experiment using an individual coronavirus uh, particle. So by um, basically squishing or smashing the coronavirus particle with the AFM tip, they were able to um, determine that the coronavirus is the most compliant virus that's been studied to date. Right. So the um, this is a very, uh, very uh, stiff, very resilient uh, particle. So not only were they able to get some mechanical information about the coronavirus, they were also able to uh, measure uh, the coronavirus size. Now, I want to point out that uh, when you um, when you measure physical dimensions with an AFM, uh, you can obtain lateral information and vertical information. Now, just as a quick FYI, the vertical information is more reliable. OK, so as we can see from this uh, cross-sectional profile, the AFM data suggests that the um, uh, that the coronavirus particle is about 100 nanometers across, 50 nanometers wide. 
But again, the best estimate of the coronavirus size is the vertical dimension. Why is that? Because when you, uh, when you consider the lateral, um, lateral data, horizontal data collected in, um, uh, from an AFM scan, not only are you taking into account the physical dimensions of the particle, but you're also taking into account the physical dimensions of the probe. It's called probe sample. This is called probe sample convolution. Okay, so this is why uh, vertical data is a little bit more reliable than horizontal data, because as the AFM probe is scanning the sample, uh, the sample or, or the AFM tip, rather, excuse me, the side of it actually hits, actually hits the sample, and it might not accurately trace uh, the um, uh, the sample uh, correctly. So how do we get? How do we? Um, how do we circumvent that issue? Well, basically, use a really expensive tip. Use an AFM tip that's been etched using um, a focus ion beam or fib, which y'all may discuss um, in the uh, intro to nano uh, fabrication uh, lecture. Or you can buy um, carbon nanotube tips where, and again, these uh, really do exist, where manufacturers have managed to attach an individual carbon nanotube to a uh, silicon nitride, uh, silicon nitride tip. If you want additional information on uh, lecture content, Regarding AFM, uh, just um, uh, feel free to email me um, if you want to schedule uh, remote access sessions because we are part of the RAIN network, which uh, Bob and uh, Oscar um, mentioned earlier in their presentations. We're a part of that network. So if you want a, a RAIN session um, involving AFM or any other of our um, instruments, feel free to contact our microscope lab coordinator. Uh, Glenn Johnson, and I'll pass it over to him for the uh, remote access session. Thank you all for your time. So you should be able to see um, camera on the right with the scanner, and this is the cantilever that's extending out, and our tip is on the bottom. We're going to look at a microchip. Uh, so first thing I want to do, set up some basic parameters. First, I want to make sure that I'm in contact mode, which is static. Right now, I'm only set up for contact mode, but we also have dynamic, which is uh, oscillating or tapping, uh, phase and some force modulation spreading resistance. And then we will select the proper probe. And each mode has a probe that goes with it. For us, it's just cont R for contact mode. Uh, then we can set up our parameters. Uh, so our field of view or image size, I'm gonna start off with 40 uh, ju just for this presentation. And our times per line is currently one second. I'm gonna make this point two seconds. Reason being is I wanna just do a quick and dirty scan to make sure that I'm in an area of interest because I don't wanna waste time. And then points per line, you know, the amount of lines of data that we obtain, uh, I like to run this at 512. That is also going to double my acquisition time because I am went from 256 to 512. Uh, I'm not gonna worry about rotation. We have a set point. I'm just gonna keep this at 20 nanonewtons. Uh, for this sample, this is a good setting. If it's too low, you may not be able to pick up enough detail in your sample. If it's too high, you may risk uh, damaging your sample or damaging your tip. But I know from experience that this 20 nanonewtons will work fine with this sample. And I'll start off with these gains at 1,000, and I'll go over the process of optimizing those gains uh, as part of this demonstration so you can see how this affects your image quality. So once I have basic parameter set up. I'm going to do a uh, course approach or a rough approach. And I'm doing this manually. Notice in the bottom left corner, you have the moving bar. If I continue to go too far, I'll crash my probe into the sample surface and risk damaging it. If first I can damage the tip, if I keep going beyond that, I can actually snap this entire cantilever right off of the probe. And that it would essentially just disappear. So once I'm in a good spot, I can go ahead now and select approach. And this is going to do a fine approach. And as amazing I, that I am, I'm not able to sense 20 nanonewtons. So I'm gonna let the microscope do that for me. So it should be making contact shortly. Okay, so my approach is done. Now I can just start. 
So you can see the, the uh, probe, it's, it's doing its raster pattern. So I'm gonna let this run for a few seconds to make sure that I'm in an area of interest. So I can start to see, uh, well, first of all, my, my image in this upper left, this is the topography image. So I can see my brighter is higher and my darker or lower, as Wes mentioned. On the right, this deflection, this is uh, directly from the photo detector. So this is raw data. So it's going to look nice, but it's only two dimensional imaging. We don't have that Z direction to get our topography from. Uh, so this is, it looks nice, but it's going to be useless for obtaining topography. I'm going to set this trace retrace. This is basically black is um, the, 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 the tip moving in the positive X direction. White is in the negative X direction. Eventually, we want to try to get these to superimpose as much as possible. Once I know that I'm in an, an area of interest, I can start optimizing my image. So a couple things that we can do with this. First thing is the times per line. I can always slow this down. By slowing down the scan rate, I'm going to pick up more detail. So instead of 0.2 seconds, I'm gonna go with 0.5. And you'll notice when I select this, the scanner is slowed down. Not only is the scanner slowed down, but you can notice on my trace retrace, this has gotten a little closer. We'll let this run for just a few seconds and you're going to be able to tell where I made my change right along this scan line. And you're going to notice that some of the smearing has cleared up. And although there is still some there, we can still try to continue to optimize this image. One of the things that I can do, I mentioned that I, I would go over these gains with you. So to optimize these gains, so I'm essentially going to turn these up really high. So I'm gonna turn both of these, the I gain and the P gain to 5,000. And you can notice, I'm, I'm gonna watch my trace retrace for the most part. You can notice that it's really jagged. It's not smooth at all. And it's probably really difficult to see uh, remotely, but in, in the imaging, you can see a ringing. And we want to get rid of that. But we can also notice that our features have gotten crystal clear. We've gone from really bad to improve to really good. My goal was to try to keep this, but get rid of this ringing because that is not really there. In order to do so, I want to lower my gains incrementally until they smooth out a little bit. So by changing it to 3000, it's a lot smoother, but there's still a little bit of jagged there. So I'll just continue to lower it until I find an area that's optimal. And again, you'll wanna let this scan for a good 20, 30 seconds so you can see the difference in the, the, the changes in your imaging by making these uh, different changes to your times per line and your gains. This is how we optimize an image. If I wanted to keep this image with these optimized settings, I would simply stop the scan and restart it just so I don't have, well, I guess you can see it better over here, all this, uh, all, you wouldn't be able to see all the changes on it. One thing I would like to do real quick, I'm gonna pause the scan. And let's say I want to zoom in on an area of interest. Notice right now I'm at 40 microns. And you can also see this on my X and Y on my in, uh, in my imaging. So I can select a, an area and I'm just gonna make this box. You can see over on the right under tool status. This is what the uh, new size of my scan is going to be. So let's see if I can get it on 20. I'll get close. And then I hit this zoom where I can move this to wherever uh, my area of interest, let's say I wanna see there. I select zoom and you'll notice on my image size is gonna go from 40 now to 19.06. I could have set that to 20 or if I want to now I can set it to 20 and that's gonna zoom in on where my center point is. Now I can start a new scan and I've essentially zoomed in and I still have all my parameters set to where they were. Notice my trace retrace is pretty good. I might lower it a little bit, 1700 or something. Those are things that you can play with, um, uh, you know, take the time to play with. But also notice in this bottom left, my remaining time, I have eight minutes and 15 seconds left to complete this scan. 
And this is at the 0.5 second time per line and 512 points per line. If I want to uh, get an even better image, I could change this to one second, but that's going to double my acquisition time. So you kind of have to find um, where your diminishing returns are and go with that. If I let this scan complete, it'll automatically save this into a gallery. And I can show that to you here. We have a, there's my gallery. So these are some images that I did in preparation uh, for this demonstration. So when it finishes a scan, it automatically puts it into this gallery and it'll continue to scan infinitely until I stop it. And it'll you know, keep putting those images into this gallery. Once I'm finished, I can just save this. It saves as an NID file, which is basically useless uh, if you want to share, share this image with someone. So that's where we can go into a post-editing process, uh, which is what I'll go ahead and show you uh, real quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this. And I'm going to share with you, this is WSXM. This is a free download. And this is one of the images that I acquired earlier. All the settings were the same with the exception of the time per line. I set that at one second. It took almost 20 minutes to acquire this image, but you can see a lot more detail because it was slowed down quite a bit. This streaking is probably debris that was on a tip that just got dragged around, so that was picked up. Uh, but what I wanted to show you with this is profile. I can select this profile and I can take a cross-sectional analysis of anywhere on this. So for example, if I want to know how tall this feature is, I can simply do a line through it and I can see on my z-axis here, it's approximately one micron in height. And I can take this and I can move it anywhere on my image. I see these small little, look like little divots. Uh, on this feature. So I'll just kind of drag it there and see what we have. Now notice that my units have changed in nanometers. And of course, these are approximations because they're not perfect. But I'm looking at probably 20 to 30 nanometers for each one of these. Um, and, and because of this, we can take, of course, our X and Y dimensions, but now we have the Z. So we can take three, three dimensional uh, dimensions from this program. One last thing I like to show, and uh, this is just something for fun. Students always like it when we go to a 3D mode. And with this, you can kind of spin your sample around. You can tilt it, try to get it somewhere that might look good. It's just something to fun to play with. But I always think it's fun to look at a microchip with a, let's see, it'll be a 20 micron field of view in, in 3D. So that is a... Um, a watered down version of one of our labs that we do. Hopefully this is enough to whet your appetite to take advantage of uh, the remote access through rain. And that's all I have unless there's any questions. So, so just quickly, Glenn, can, yep. can people keep, people can actually operate them this remotely. They can actually do uh, hit, hit the buttons, right? Basically. Yes, that is correct. Uh, doing this remotely, I would be able to give you the controls and uh, if I uh, go to a new share here and. I'm not I saying you have to do it now. I'm just saying, yeah, just saying you have yeah, to Yeah, yeah. You would be able to change any of this remotely. My hands would be off. It's, it's all yours. So that, that can be achieved remotely. Cool. And then, of course, when we're finished, I could email all uh, images back to you. And, and uh, I, I did get an answer from the answer man. Uh, Dr. Sanders, and he said the cost of an AFM uh, Wesley, our, our, our East Coast Wesley, um, is about ten to twelve k uh, for okay. for that for that. Yeah, um, I think when they purchased this one, and it was pro I'm guessing eight to ten years ago, it was about thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Good to know the price is going down. Great, great. I want to right. point out that 10, the 10 and 12 estimate is for the portable and for our easy scan that the students actually use. That's in excess of 30K, depending on your bells and whistles that you have added to it. Uh, you, uh, you mean you want wheels on that car? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yes. All right, cool.